Right, it's time for this week's feature, that part of the show that viewers everywhere are already calling this week's feature. When an industry gets nostalgic about its past, you can tell it's reached full maturity. Unfortunately, I haven't, which is why I'm wearing an atrocious 70s shirt as a cheap gag about retro games. Yes, retro is the word on everyone's lips at the moment, and titles like Namco Museum, Space Invaders and the Williams Arcade Classics are rising from the grave to fill some fat publishers' bulging pockets once more. I went along to the world's first retro game exhibition in HMV in London to visit some old friends. 1978, the Labour Party in Britain was in its death throes with the winter of discontent, but there was good news for video game punters in the home because the Atari 2600 came out. I was only eight years old at the time. This was the first home console that you could buy. It was very successful because it was mostly arcade conversions, things like uh, Phoenix, which you can see here. Unfortunately, my family couldn't afford one because it cost £100 and we were living in a hole in the street at the time. <laughs> This was the first computer I ever owned, the ZX Spectrum. The year was 1982, music-wise, it was the modern romantic era of Adam and the Ants, Spanner Ballet and Duran Duran. This was a great little machine, it had 14,000 titles, it was a real gaming boom around this. It also saw the first of a systems war, you had the ZX Spectrum and you also had the Commodore 64. Commodore 64 only had 10,000 titles released for it. Pretty much the same games, but it was a lot bigger, bulkier, a lot less fashionable. I had a ZX Spectrum, and we always thought that people who had Commodore 64s smelled a little bit. Between them, the Spectrum and Commodore launched the British game scene. It's hard to believe now, but at the time, these graphics from Luna Jetman were every bit as revolutionary as something like Wipeout seems today. Night Lore was another classic produced by the company that was to become rare, the people behind Killer Instinct. The Wolf theme, obviously a favourite of theirs even then. Manic Miner might look pretty primitive to you, but without this, Mario would still be sticking his hand up blokes U-bends. Some folk believe the playability of these games make them better than most of today's efforts. I thought I'd ask games design legend Peter Molyneux what he thought of them in my office. Is there any lessons that can be learnt by programmers now from going back and looking at these old classic games? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the thing is that all those old classic games were just truly gameplay orientated. And that's what a lot of people forget. You've got flashy graphics, wonderful sound, and great intro sequences, and then, oops, it's the last month before we finish the game. Oh, what, what have we forgotten? Uh, I know, gameplay. Back at the exhibition, all these people agreed, bless them, fighting back tears of admiration as they confronted their heritage. It's interesting to look at old games as a good reminder of what gameplay was years and years ago. I thought I would have to say, would I swap my copy of Tekken 2 for two copies of Mattel in television soccer? I don't think so. 